scrub hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Mm. Don't need four pesticides to poison all our soil. People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. When right now, it's time to hell. Thank you for taking Time for Hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening for Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and, of course, now on the Roku TV network. Make it a point to go to timeforhemp.com and check out our online garden. We are growing marijuana on our site. That's it, baby. You can come in and check it out morning, noon, and night and watch us fertilize and watch us change the lighting and watch us separate the males from the females and then watch it flower and then watch us harvest it and then watch us dry it out and smoke it. And we're going to be doing different sized gardens off and on throughout the course of the next two years at Time for Hemp. Doing it live with Wolf Siegel as the primary farmer. It is Tuesday, and on Tuesday, we want to salute all the hardworking people up in Canada. And, of course, we have, as my joint host every Tuesday, Kelly Kristen from KDK Distributors. Hi, Kelly. How's, how's your 2016 going? Is it going pretty good? <laughs> 20. <laughs> Every day is a great day, as you know, Casper. Yeah, you bet. And uh, and you, did you have uh, good holidays? I had a nice holiday season. I worked myself silly trying to make the network even better, and, and we got all kinds of great content coming out. So, yeah, I didn't really rest during the holidays, but I did what I enjoyed doing most. Spent my time with my loved ones, the marijuana movement. <laughs> and we also have on the program today somebody else who feels that way who likes to work through the holidays and is a very dedicated activist up in Canada. He's been a guest on our show before Kelly. I think you know Neil Magnuson. Good morning, Hello, Neil. Neil. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thanks, Kelly. How are you guys? Yeah, you bad, huh? Every day is a great day, as I always say. Every day is a great day. <laughs> Especially nowadays that we seem to be winning the battle here, eh? I think so. We've certainly turned the corner as, uh, as well, unless you're, uh, I guess, living in Igloo, you must know that uh, we're, we're actually moving towards legalization in Canada of cannabis for recreational use. Um, it's an absolute uh, uh, huge uh, thing um, that the Liberals are, are it was one of their first things they said they were going to do. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm stoked. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you are too, Neil. Yeah, very stoked. Of course, there's a little bit of concern as to what form of legalization we're going to get. I mean, if you can't grow your own, we don't think it's a real legalization. And if it's still $10 a gram, gram then that's not legalization either, and you're still going to have a thriving black market. So we're just waiting to see what Trudeau's going to do, and we're, we're trying to work with the liberals and encourage them to do it right. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, Colorado already knows that they tax it so heavily that they did nothing but probably help out the uh, black market. I mean, uh, if it's taxed fair and done properly... There's no reason why there should be a black market, and 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 hopefully it's a free market, and you and I could uh, go ahead and start our own micro uh, marijuana grow and uh, and and grow our favorite strain and uh, grow it organically or however we want to do it, and uh, hopefully be able to market it. I think that would be really awesome. I think we would uh, improve the quality of our cannabis uh, available coast to coast, and uh, yeah give everybody a fair and equal shot at it. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the campaign to overgrow the government has been successful and that uh, we need to continue doing that. Uh, no matter what happens, I'd like to see, uh, you know, this coming year, everybody plant a, a pot plant in their, uh, in their front garden, uh, put them in their living room window. Uh, you know, let's, let's just continue to make this plant just a normal everyday plant, other than the fact that it's one of the best plants. But, you know, any restriction on how many plants you can have, that's ridiculous. 
Um, you know, I mean, they don't tell you how many blueberry bushes you can have or how many tomato plants you can have. Uh, cannabis is just another plant in the garden, although, like I say, it's one of the most beneficial and useful. And also, it's one of the least uh, potentially harmful plants. You can die of an overdose of just about anything you can grow in your garden, but not cannabis. So there's no justification for any uh, uh, over-regulation or restrictions on home growing for sure. Uh, I like what the uh, the new prime minister in Canada had to say when he took the podium, uh, and that was sunny ways. And uh, and why are we doing this when he was asked a question about something else? He said, because it's 2015. And I think we're going to hold them to that, that it's 2015, it's time to end the reefer madness and uh, say they're sorry. They should really apologize for all these years of oppression and lies. And then let's move forward with a regulatory system that matches the nature of the product itself. Well, that's my hope. I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Free the weed, so to speak, and uh, let people grow their own. And, and let's face it, not everybody's going to want to grow their own. People who are living in apartments or smaller spaces and, you know, they don't have the time uh, because it, there, it does take time and effort to, to make a quality product. Not everybody's going to do that. Um, so having the uh, having a free wheel uh, as it as it should be to the people, uh, they can decide for themselves whether they'd like to put a plant in the window or in their backyard in their garden along with their tomatoes or whatever they may uh, else they may be growing. Um, and for those people who can't or don't wish not to, uh, it should be available. Uh, um, not only, I mean, I don't want to cut out the licensed producers either. They've no doubt invested a lot of time, money, and effort as well to uh, meet government regulations and do that kind of thing. But, you know, again, a free market system, they can be the, the you know, the big breweries like the Molsons of the world, and, and, and we can still have the little microbreweries, so to speak, where uh, people are making their specialty product, and uh, I, I think it's going to be really, really awesome. I can't wait for the day when I can walk through the door and shop on the shelf for uh, a cannabis that suits my needs, whether it be a heavy indica, heavy sativa, somewhere in between, uh, or high CBD because I, it helps me a little bit with my pain. I, I'm, I'm ecstatic with the idea that, that it's going to happen. Um, of course, it's government and government wheels do move slowly, uh, but they've already started to act, as you know. And, uh, um, yeah, it's going to be a fantastic day in Canada when, <laughs> when we can walk in the door and uh, purchase cannabis freely, legally, and uh, have our own choice. And without the stigma. You know? Absolutely. And, I, and I, agree with, I agree with you. There is huge opportunity for commercial uh, success in cannabinoid products, all sorts of different things that they could be doing, and not just the flowers themselves. But uh, so many other products that are already on shelves and dispensaries to here, there's just huge opportunity. We don't need to have the monopolies. Uh, I'm not against the LPs, although I certainly don't like it when I, I hear them uh, posturing for, for getting that monopolistic type model. I don't like that at all. They should not be uh, dissing the dispensaries or, or actively wanting those places closed down. But other than that, I mean, there are people growing weed and they're selling weed. And uh, I don't like the Marlboro type, uh, you know, uh, cannabis thing, but, but sure, it should be available. If they regulate it the same as alcohol, we'll be fine, because alcohol is, is not regulated the way that it should be. Alcohol is a very dangerous product. It causes all sorts of problems and costs to our society, and so it should be regulated a lot more than it is, but the government's making money off alcohol. They're the ones behind the distribution, so it's a bit of a conflict of interest for them. And so we've got a lot of advertising and promotion of alcohol products. We've got alcohol products that are, are, are tailored to, I don't know if it's kids, but, man, you know, they got bubblegum-flavored alcohol. they got all kinds of different stuff. They sell alcohol uh, candies in, in some of the different places. So if we get the same thing as that, I think we'll be all right. And and tobacco, I mean, here in BC, you can buy uh, commercial cigarettes in grocery stores and gas stations, drug stores, uh, cafes, all over the place. So, you know, cannabis should not be regulated any more heavily than those products, that's for sure. 
And I think that anybody that wants to, to sell to the public should have an easy access to be able to do that. And we shouldn't be restricted to just going into liquor stores to buy cannabis, that's for sure. Lots of people are using cannabis as a replacement to a subst substance uh, in place of alcohol, and they shouldn't be forced to go into an alcohol vending place to get it. But now we've got alcohol being sold in grocery stores here in B.C., so I think it'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Go and pick up your loaf of bread, your quart of milk, and a little uh, a little eighth of uh, something new that's on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a wonderful new world, I think. I'm really optimistic. I've never been so optimistic, for sure. Well, there's no doubt it's happening. And, uh, you know, I really haven't heard anything from the Conservatives about it since... Uh, I, I think they've they've obviously come to the realization this is something that the people have wanted for a long time. Uh, let's face it; it's uh, it's much more normalized than 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 we like to to believe. Um, and um, for the people like Stephen Harper who have absolutely no room in their life for it, hey, no problem, man. Same same deal. You can have the choice. You can go in and purchase it. Or you don't. Not a big deal. I'm not gonna. I'm not concerned about people who don't use cannabis. I, I'm sure that there is going to be a small number of people who will now try cannabis uh, because it's legal. But let's face it: the vast majority of people that use it medicinally or use it recreationally, um, they're still. That's just going to continue on, and I, I don't think it's going to change the numbers drastically. But it is a huge business. And, um, yeah, let's, let's hope they get it right the first time. Um, you know, uh, that doesn't always happen. But, hey, I, you know, I believe more in this government than I have in any other in my lifetime. Uh, just, it just seems like you say when, when Justin Trudeau answered his question um, as to why uh, he felt that um, I, I, I believe it was the number of women in in um, That's correct, the yeah. minister's office and, and that kind of stuff with power positions, right? And he yeah. was pretty, you know, said, hey, I, I think that it should be this way, that it's more equal in terms of the population. And they asked him why that was important to him. And he just looked at him and said, well, it's 2015. Like, hello, get your head out of your yeah. butt, jump into reality yeah. here, and let's uh, let's move forward. It's just refreshing to see such a common sense approach and, uh, and I hope that carries through with everything that they do. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, prohibition just gave us a world that was so hypocritical, upside down and backwards. Uh, it, it didn't make sense. It's, it's hard to navigate for young people growing up in this world when, when people are being arrested for smoking marijuana, but there's people standing on the street corner that are smoking commercial tobacco, and the evidence is clear that commercial tobacco is killing millions of people every year around the world, and cannabis has never killed anybody in the whole history of <laughs> our, our planet. So, you know, the, the hypocrisy was just ridiculous. It, it is time to undo all of that, to stop the reefer madness. Uh, on your other point about, uh, you know, if Stephen Harper doesn't want to go buy cannabis, he shouldn't have to. Uh, I agree with you. I don't think cannabis should be mandatory for everybody, uh, certain people. Uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, I, I, it would be sane to me if a person was repeatedly going into the, the courts, uh, having done violence, for the courts to say to that person, well, you're now restricted uh, from going into the public until your cannabinoid level is at a certain height, you know? Like, <laughs> there are some people that maybe should have to smoke weed. I got a couple of friends that know themselves that they don't go out unless they smoke the joint because they could be dangerous to the public. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe world leaders, you know, I think that Trudeau should sit down and have a little puff with uh, with Obama. In fact, I'm sure they're going to share a bong. But, that, that uh, you know, whatever awesome. they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and his dad did too, you know. I mean, Pierre, he, he admitted quite freely that he'd smoked many things. And he traveled around the world and sat down with other people in other countries and other cultures and imbibed in, in their recreational smoking substances too so you know a, a, a more sane world is what i think we're going to get out of this it's what i've been fighting for for all these years you know i haven't really been fighting for the right for people to get high and smoke weed i think they should be able to but for me it's been freedom and a world where our natural rights as individuals are recognized by these public servants that we have instead of leaders like uh, tyrants and dictators and kings and queens 
Those people are passe. That's so not 2015 to have dictators and tyrants. What it's about now is not just dumbocracy where 51% get to tell the other 49% what they can and cannot do, but a real recognition and respect for the natural right of each individual as a sovereign being that gets to do whatever he wants to do and doesn't have to do nothing if he doesn't want to unless someone's being hurt with his action or inaction, in which case everybody needs to, you know, step in and make sure that people don't hurt other people. But if they're not hurting anybody else, they shouldn't be forced into behaviors or not, uh, not being allowed to do things that don't harm anybody for sure. And, and I hope that's the new sanity that we get in the world coming up. It's a lot to ask in a world controlled by corporations who really want to, you know, just exploit us. But it, it's, it's what the future can be if we legalize weed and then go from there. Because the, legal, the, the prohibition or attempted prohibition of cannabis was the most glaring and obvious example of how we were not free as individuals uh, in this world. So that's the first step in getting some sanity in, involved. So I think world leaders should have to probably mandatorily uh, imbibe in some cannabis during uh, certain negotiations and when they're deciding certain things to make sure that they don't get corrupted and, uh, and swept up by the corporate agenda. <laughs> there's, there's my rat for the day. I <laughs> know, uh, that's quite spectacular. I, uh, I, I just, I, I have this, you've planted this beautiful vision in my, in my head of, of Obama and, and, and Trudeau uh, sitting down and, like you say, sharing a, a peace pipe and uh, having just some good old uh, everyday uh, normal conversation and uh, solve some of the world's problems. Yeah, let's stop this war shit. It's 2015. We shouldn't be doing that anymore either. No, it's a brand new year. It's uh, 2016. And with that said, we're going to take a commercial break and, c and come back and pay our bills here at Time for Hemp. Sativa seeds. Serious seeds are the creators of legendary strains like AK-47, Bubblegum, Chronic, Cali Mist, and White Russian. The AK-47 is probably the most avoided strain on the planet. The high THC content of AK-47 makes it the perfect medical strain for patients seeking quick pain relief. Cali Mist is an almost pure sativa. Female medical cannabis patients have reported that this strain helps relieve menstrual cramps. Serious Seeds just acquired another Dutch high-quality seed bank, Magus Genetics. From now on, Serious Seeds can offer you even more award-winning strains. The fine folks at Serious Seeds strive to breed the best cannabis genetics that they can find, so patients can rely on the effectiveness of their medicine. Go to SeriousSeeds.com to grow your medicine. That site again is SeriousSeeds.com. We're on the right path, sunset, on the dark 
favorite tunes i found it last year on youtube it's called sunset on the ganja farm i suggest you do a search for it it's a groovy little video i love the the group and i would encourage you to go to their website and let them know that you heard about them here on the big broadcast maybe even buy a cd it is time for hemp all around the world we are no longer a one-hour broadcast, but we have come together as a team of people who are dedicated to ending prohibition all around the world. All the programming here on Time for Hemp is free to the public, free to download as well. Our archives are normally up to date, and every program that we've ever done can be found there, downloaded for free, and shared with your friends, which we do encourage you to do. We have all kinds of apps for your smart devices from the Google App Store and the iHeart Store and the uh, all kinds of great iTunes that you can get their little app and put it into your handheld. And whether you're at a bus stop or if you're uh, jogging or if you're just sitting quietly at home, you can always take time for hemp. It is Tuesday, and on Tuesday we put a spotlight on 
the hardworking activists up in Canada with my joint host, KDK distributor founder, Kelly Kristen. And Kelly, you've been doing this for a handful of years, and I know 2016 you're going to continue to help the global medical marijuana movement by helping patients who cannot afford a quality way of consuming their medication to have a quality way to consume their medication. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, quality is the word for sure. Uh, quality vaporization is what you speak of. And um, for those of you that uh, most of you now are all familiar with vaporization and its benefits, um, what we've been doing for the last three or, three or four years now is giving away a well, one of these quality vaporizers to a medical patient somewhere in the world. So wherever you're listening, if you are a medical patient and you use cannabis, you are almost eligible uh, for a free vaporizer. <laughs> the only other requirement is, is that you could not possibly afford one under normal circumstances because you're on a assisted income, a disability pension, a, a old age pension, welfare, whatever the case may be, or for some of you, even no income at all. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking for you. We know there's, there's lots of you out there. So if you're listening, um, certainly uh, pay attention. And if you're not one of those people and you can afford a quality vaporizer, maybe you know someone who couldn't and make them aware that it is it is possible to get a free vaporizer. And, and yes, it's totally free. We actually pay to ship it right to your door. And um, we, we like to draw a person once a month and, uh, and, and give one away. Um, so if you're in that boat where you're, you're using it medicinally, this wonderful plant, and um, you'd like to have a quality vaporizer but can't afford one, simply uh, send me an email to Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at K-D-K wholesale.ca. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and um, and we'll put you in the pile, and uh, hopefully you're the uh, next uh, lucky recipient to get a, a free vaporizer. And on behalf of the medical marijuana movement, Kelly, that is a very gracious thing that you and your team do, and thank you so much for uh, doing so. You said it's been a about four or five years now, you started with our, our family here on Time for Hemp in 2009, Kelly. And here no it is, way. Yeah. Oh, really? and here it is, 2016. I and we're you. still friends. <laughs> <laughs> I know, in spite of the fact that I'm grumpy, cantankerous, and hard to get along with. But I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Canadians are just naturally nice when they come out of the womb. So that's helped you and your team to overlook my shortcomings. So thank you so much. <laughs> With that said, we're going to get back to our joint chat here on the Big Joint Broadcast. Don't forget, anytime you hear the word joint, nearly 2.5 million people all around the world pack their vaporizers, their bongs, their pipes, twist up a joint, and take time for hemp. Kelly? Cool. Well, Neil, we uh, we pretty much covered, I think, the uh, legalization and what we we're hoping for for everybody to to uh, that it just be a free and open enterprise kind of thing, which would be ideal. I, I can't imagine the other new products that people are going to dream up um, with uh, legalization, and uh, um, we see it in the U.S. I mean, there's tons of of subsidiary products made with cannabis oils, so people don't have to smoke it; they can consume it. Uh, orally and uh, um, yeah I, I welcome the opportunity I, I, I think we, we need a cannabis store just all you know its own brick and mortar thing because there's going to be not just cannabis and several different types of cannabis high in CBD or high in THC or uh, you know um, whatever your you know the, the possibilities of course are endless as you can see if you look around on the internet by the varieties of strains available from literally hundreds of, of cannabis seed companies. And within those companies, some of them have as many as 50 or more strains. So you multiply that out, the uh, variety is quite mind boggling. And uh, I'm assuming for the rest of my life, I could try a new different, a new, a different strain every week 
and uh, not be able to get through them all. So I look forward to that very much. <laughs> it take you it take you years to get through them if you were doing one a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, you bet. Um, well, I like to have a, a strain for at least a week because then it, I, I really get a feel for what it does for me, how it makes me feel, how much I need to put in my vaporizer to get me where I need to be, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But anyhow, beyond that, um, I know that there are have been some problems late last year for dispensaries in British Columbia. Um, I don't know why. I don't think anybody knows why. Um, with with legalization around the corner, why? What's the interest in stepping up and trying to do something to these people now? It makes absolutely no sense. Um, cost wise, of course, manpower, all that kind of stuff. It's all in vain, or going to be in vain. I mean, I don't know who gives the directive and decides that this is the right thing to do. But let's face it, it's it's insane. It, yeah, it's crazy, actually. And, uh, yeah, no, I agree. And I, I feel for you guys out there in British Columbia because you really have been our California, I guess, to the United States where it's really, um, you know, more more progressive and, and more forward thinking than the rest of the country. Uh, certainly a ton more worth, you know, we're beside you in, in the province of Alberta and we're the exact opposite. So... Uh, I really look up to you guys out there and all the things that you've done um, and uh, uh, the oppression here um, just really keeps people keeps people out of the limelight. Uh, so many more people would be involved in like our 420 rallies in past years and stuff like that, but they're scared because if they get out there and uh, and their coworkers see them or or their family members see them or whatever they like you say there's that still that stigma associated with it and it's more relevant here in Alberta than anywhere in the country as far as I'm concerned or certainly anywhere I've ever been and uh, I you know we have no dispensaries here so we can't even have the type of problems that you have out there and it's it's really unfortunate because as you know a lot of these, you probably know a lot of these people personally, they've put a lot of time and effort and care into helping medical patients over the years, and now they're being roused up by the uh, authorities uh, in, in right in the light of, le of legalization. It just makes no sense. Yeah, it really, uh, you're, you're very accurate, and we are next door to each other, but we're the, on the opposite ends of things uh, between Alberta and B.C., uh, and in Vancouver especially, there's such a hub of uh, cannabis family activists here uh, doing a lot of stuff. And one of the things we've done is opened a lot of dispensaries. And we've forced the issue so hard because every time they tried to close a place down, starting with Mark Emery's store, you know, 20 years ago and, and with these dispensaries as well, any time they closed them down, we opened them right back up the next day or later that afternoon. Uh, same with the ones they just raided in Nanaimo. They, they all opened right back up the next day. Uh, so there's that going on. Uh, and these, I think, are driven by just rogue RCMP uh, detachments or members that uh, have taken it upon themselves to act upon what they see are complaints from the public. If they get anybody saying anything, they, they seem to act on it. Uh, they have their own personal agendas on that. I don't think it's coming from the top. Uh, here in Vancouver, uh, you know, they, when they started a process of wanting to regulate these dispensaries because there was over a hundred of them, and they came out with these uh, regulations, and some of them, seven of them at least, were were just absolutely ridiculous and harming uh, greatly those people that had had put these dispensaries in place and were helping uh, patients. And so now, I just see today that uh, they've revealed eight of the 11 dispensaries that they're going to approve out of the 176 applications that they have. So there's now 176 uh, dispensaries in Vancouver operating that have uh, put in applications to the city. The city has said they're going to, they're going to uh, whittle them all down to 11, and they've now come up with eight of them, and they've given the eight uh, here. But I only recognize two out of the eight dispensaries that they... Uh, they have on their list here. The other ones I've never even heard of before, um, because this they're just popping up like crazy everywhere. Right. The, the the licensing on these dispensaries, the, the fact they're going to decluster them uh, by keeping them 300 uh, meters away from any other dispensaries, from any uh, schools or community centers, 
um, that's going to result in only 11 being allowed to stay open. So all the rest have to fire their employees or lay them off and close their, their businesses down and uh, lose their investments and all of the rest of that, according to the city. That, that's not going to happen. None of them are closing down voluntarily, and I don't think the police are going to be involved in closing any of them down. Uh, all the city has is a, a threat against them by fining the owners uh, up to like $10,000 a day uh, for staying open. And uh, the, many of the owners feel that that's not going to fly in court. There's a bunch of lawsuits about to be launched against the city for what they're trying to do here. Uh, they've banned edibles, for example, which is just crazy. Uh, so many people rely on the edibles uh, that don't want to have to smoke cannabis. Uh, and and they, they said it was to protect kids. I mean, and that's just insane, too, because, I mean, if they're... It, if you can't go to a, a dispensary and get your edibles in in a, 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 a properly packaged, childproof container that's got the right amount of what's in there on it, um, you're going to cook it at home yourself or buy it on the black market. You don't know what's in each dose. They're not going to be packaged properly. If you're cooking it at home, well, you, you're making cookies for yourself and you got kids. Well, your kids, because that, that's the concern with the kids, of course, except that they never get hurt by cannabis. But your kids are going to know you're making cookies. So you got to make some for them too because, you know, and then they're going to eat theirs first and they're going to find yours when you're away because that's what kids do. So I told the city of Vancouver in their public forum that they're very fortunate that cannabis doesn't actually harm kids because if it did, banning them, the sale of them from dispensaries properly packaged and dosed and everything is going to result in way more kids getting into cannabis and they would be harmed except that they, they aren't. But uh, It's just crazy what they're doing and like you say, with and, and when they did this, legalization was potentially around the corner and uh, the people I spoke to at City Hall said, yeah, we know that you know if Justin Trudeau was to somehow manage to get elected that they might change everything. But they still seem to be going ahead with their process, even though he not only uh, managed to win the election, he won it with a majority. So uh, we'll see what happens. Well, it's, it seems strange to me. I, I sort of need a little bit of clarification. When you said they were going to whittle it down to 11, was that a magical number they wanted to get to? Or that's the magical that's number the that came up after all their regulations? Well, late October, they announced that only 11 dispensaries had met the standards to move forward uh, with an application. So, that, <laughs> yeah, that's whittling I mean, it down already. That's not even ten yeah. <laughs> percent. <laughs> that's a that's a golden ticket for for eleven dispensary owners that would uh, get to have uh, the whole market share in Vancouver if it was actually to be the reality that the city hall sees. Right. But like I say, none of them are going to close down. Uh, these places, uh, they're all they're all <laughs> determined. You know, I was very surprised that there was any applications for the $30,000 a year business license that they wanted to give out. Um, I didn't think any of the uh, dispensaries would apply, but they all did. So I went and visited each one of them. I put on a protest at City Hall and I went and delivered flyers. So I got to go into over 100 different dispensaries in Vancouver. And uh, I, I, I got the sense from all of them. I, I figured out at the end of it what it was. They're all going to apply because none of them want to close. They're all dealing with, with patients that they feel very responsible for. They, they get such a wonderful feeling of helping people every day by going to work that they were going to do anything they could to stay open, even pay the, the huge extortion $30,000 license fee. Um, and in fact, 176 applied. I want, to touch on that, I want to touch on that $30,000 business license. Obviously, um, I paid my business, uh, bought my business license here just um, several days ago. This is uh -huh. my cost for my business license, $239. Okay. Now, $30,000 yeah. for a business license. Is there or are you aware of any other businesses that are charged a $30,000 business license fee? I mean, it, it, no. it's, it's the closest. The closest was half of that. There, there, there is one license that they give out for fifteen thousand dollars a year, and that's to the Pacific National Exhibition that uh, has about a, a three-week stint where they have maybe three hundred businesses all operating under the same umbrella. Uh, next to that are the massage parlors and the casinos. The casinos were at twelve thousand dollars a year, and massage parlors are at ten. And there's nothing anywhere close. To those two, a pharmacy is about one hundred and seventy-five dollars in, in in Vancouver here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A typical so, business license here, like you say, minus two hundred and eighty-nine dollars for a year. 
And when you say 30,000, I mean, that just obviously their intention is to rape the uh, the uh, cannabis consumer. Uh, let's, I, I, you know, I, I don't know who comes up with a number like, well, we're charging oh. almost all businesses pay less than $500 a year, but we got par- massage parlors. The, the the exhibition, I understand, okay, like you say, they got a lot of businesses there for a, a, f- a few weeks or whatever, okay, they can afford to pay that, that may make sense. Massage parlors, well, we all know what they, most of them really are, and we understand why theirs are a little high, but now it seems to me that's just a tax on prostitution, uh, and, yeah. and so are they not, you know, essentially saying that that's really legal as well, and we're just going to tax it heavier, I don't know, it's sin tax or whatever you want to call it. Let's you know yeah. call it what it is. It's a cash grab from uh, from these guys, and it just I, well, it's, I mean, it's mind boggling. Medical cannabis dispensaries, where everybody is screened and has doctor support for being there, there's no sin involved in going there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's just ludicrous that they would want to extort from these people, and it's the patients that are going to pay that fee, obviously. I mean, that, that nobody else is paying that. The, the business owner only gets his money from the patients. So they're just harming people so harshly with these regulations of theirs. <laughs> I, I hope they're charged criminally, not just uh, sued. There, there's lawsuits coming against them, but I hope they're charged criminally down the road for this. With public servants, uh, as a city hall, they have no business harming anybody. Their, their mandate is to try to prevent harm. That's why they're putting bylaws and regulations in place is because there's evidence that there's harm being caused unless they do that. But when they start putting regulations that are completely unjustified onto places that harm the business owners and their, their clientele, well, that's way out of the realm of what these public municipal servants are supposed to be doing for us. So I don't know what's going to happen down the road. I hope we get some sanity in this. It's 2016. My God, we should be figuring this stuff out and not allowing this to happen for sure. Sure. No, I'm with you 100. percent But I, I, I really believe that common sense again will prevail, and they'll just look at it like, "What are we doing here?" Uh, um, it makes no sense in the light of of complete legalized or you know uh, a recreational uh, use, um, or just opening it up across the board. And and um, hopefully, uh, the, all these dispensaries remain because um, they certainly do uh, provide a service. Uh, to the medicinal community, and again, they've invested time, money, and effort, and um, they shouldn't be punished uh, for what they've done. That's a for sure. Uh, and let's move forward. And let's let's just move forward and uh, be realistic about it. Thirty thousand dollar license. I mean, come on. Who you PFA that or plucked it from air? And it's got to be so much more than everybody else. It it makes absolutely no sense. Well, and, and, on, and look at the hypocrisy of the alcohol dispensaries. We have thousands of alcohol dispensaries all over Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, they, they just like cannabis dispensaries, pretty much. You walk in there uh, behind the counter on a mirrored wall. There's shelves of, of jars and bottles of different drugs, in, mostly in liquid form. But, they, you know, alcohol dispensaries, you can take your kids into these places. They serve edibles with these, these things. It's like... Uh, it just drives me crazy that we're so still so hip- hypocritical in our society. Sure. But I, I do think it's coming that it's going to work itself out. <laughs> well, when you think about it, I wonder, I, I, I should run them, try to find out the numbers of establishments that serve alcohol, not just bars, but restaurants. And uh, uh, I mean, and, wow, there's got to be a nightclub. a nightclub. I mean, how many places dispense alcohol, let alone just liquor stores? I mean, we're privatized. Oh, I know. We're privatized with liquor stores here in Alberta. So we have tons of liquor stores. You don't have to go very far to find one. And it's not limited I'm hours. Grocery stores. You know, they're, guess they're, open, you know, they're open till 2 a.m. and open up earlier in the day. And they've just, and the Alberta government opened it up a long time ago, uh, basically. And, um, uh, you know, it's relatively easy to get a license to dispense alcohol. Or to sell alcohol, yeah. and uh, yeah, we have our per capita on alcohol has got to be phenomenal. I mean, they, you know, even you go to the university, they have areas in there where they serve alcohol. Um, just, yeah. You know, so so in educational facilities as well as not just bars, nightclubs, pubs, whatever, but restaurants, and yeah, it's it's got to be phenomenal 
how many places you can get alcohol at in our country. Yeah. And they're saying that the, the, the medical cannabis dispensaries can't be within 300 meters of each other. And we've got alcohol dispensaries side by side, rows of them up and down the main commercial streets in Vancouver. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it, it can't last for long, this kind of hypocrisy. My God, it's 2016. Let's get with the program. <laughs> you know? Yeehaw. Yeah. I, I, I follow you there. So let's... Uh, Let's hope that they uh, just basically dismiss everything with what's going on there. Let's hope that they make it a free market and uh, allow people to grow for themselves, allow the licensed producers to sell, and allow people to open up businesses to sell cannabis and cannabis-related products. Well, I'm going to allow us to take a break here and pay our bills, and then we're going to come back in just two minutes and pick up where we left off here at Time for Hemp. You are listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. THCF Medical Clinics are the premier physician's clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastro intestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. Well, I went and had a bowl, good green reefer, big fat don't be much, much sweeter. Hide it, don't hide it. You are listening to Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, and of course, the new Roku TV network on uh, Roku has uh, the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network on it. You can go to timeforhemp.com and get the Roku TV code that you need to put into your Roku account so that you can watch the Time for Hemp channel. And uh, we have all kinds of great programming on there. Our hosts today and I are working diligently to raise the voice of the marijuana movement and so is our guest he does pot tv pot tv used to show my show the time for hemp global um see the time for hemp tv series when we were doing it many many moons ago and I know Chris Bennett has worked hard and diligently with pot tv and now it's in the hands of someone else who's running it and Crop King Seeds has done a nice job in producing a television studio for them to produce new programming that if they want us to, we will broadcast it on our Roku channel. With that said, I will pass this last part of our show to our joint guest and our joint host here on the big joint broadcast at Time for Hemp. Kelly? Well, where are we going to move to now, I think? Um, you got six minutes to figure it out. We've only got six minutes well <laughs> <laughs> i know that um uh i'm a little bit stuck right at the moment i'm trying to uh, dig something out from deep back in my brain that we can uh, how about sensible bc what's going on with sensible bc in the light of potential legalization are they continuing to work do they have anything on are they working with the government at all or anything like that Yep, I was talking to Dana yesterday. Uh, there's there's a, a new campaign coming up for them because uh, what's going to really happen with legalization is it's going to come down to the, the provinces regulating, and each municipality will be able to decide through their mayor and council 
uh, you know, how they're going to or if they're going to allow for cannabis to be distributed from their communities. And so Central VC has a role to play in that by, by contacting the mayors, by a program of, of educating the mayors and, uh, and helping to facilitate uh, that happening properly in these communities where there could be some objection to it. There, you know, some, some communities, uh, mayor and councils uh, aren't up to speed on uh, being educated about cannabis. They're still stuck in some of the reefer madness stuff. So Central VC still has a huge number of volunteers uh, in their database and, uh, you know, they work with the Nation Builder software, so there's a, a good communication uh, network set up amongst them. And there will be things for them to do as we try to make sure that Canada takes its place in the world as a leader and not a follower in how to uh, legalize. Because we, we don't want to be following Colorado and Washington and these other places where the taxation is so high that the price means a thriving black market continues uh, we need Canada to take the lead and do it right here and eliminate the black market and allow for easy access to Canadians and end the stigmatization that's been happening for all these decades with the reefer madness lies for sure. Uh, just on another note, I, with, with what Casper was talking about there in Pot TV, Crop King Seeds has uh, been very generous in, in funding so many of our different activities here, and uh, they've put together a package for us to be able to make uh, new studios for Pot TV, and I've had the, the privilege of being the guy to renovate. To, it's the second floor of Mark Emery's building uh, in the Pot Block in Vancouver here, and we're going to have state-of-the-art uh, studios coming right up. We're, we're nearly finished the work that we're doing there. So thanks to Crop King Seeds for all of their support and uh, helping us with that. And I look forward to uh, broadcasting from our, our new studios, uh, in uh, you know, not too far into this new year here. I tell you. Well, it's it, nice, nice to have lots of support, of course. And, and uh, let's face it, we need uh, corporate support wherever wherever we can get it still um, as we continue to move, move towards full and, and uh, full legalization. So, yeah, kudos to companies like Crop King to... Uh, to make this possible. Uh, For sure, yeah. I tell you, it's nice to have them on board. We're also growing their seeds in our online garden. Uh, just a yeah. reminder to people that we are uh, growing uh, see, Crop King seeds, seeds from Mr. Nice, and we're growing seeds from a couple of other companies as well. We got lights in there from Indigro and a couple of other great lighting companies, Johnson's Lighting. So we do product placement. And uh, if you want to see how well Crop King seeds grow, uh, you can tune in and check that out on our website as well. I just had to say say something about that because uh, that's what they're all about, the seeds. And we've got the seeds that they are all about growing in front of a camera. Yeah, these sponsors are so important. We've had numerous events uh, here in, in Vancouver and across Canada where we've raised funds uh, to pay for the lawyers to fight the challenges in court, to get the injunction against the uh, licensed producer program that Health Canada instituted, to get our right to be able to, to extract the cannabinoids off the cannabis plant. It was another court case that was funded uh, because of these corporate sponsors that have come along. And I, I hesitate to use the word corporate, but uh, certainly the businesses, the cannabis businesses, uh, have have kicked in uh, many of them and uh, made these things possible. The different fundraisers, uh, the glass gathering up in uh, in Burton in BC, which is a wonderful event that happens every year, wouldn't happen without all the sponsors that help that with that. So yeah, we really need to support these places that have supported our movement. We wouldn't be where we are without them for sure. And speaking of sponsors and time and all, we are down to the last couple of minutes of the big broadcast. So if you want to give a shout out to any of your sponsors there on your network or any uh, major uh, player on your team or any organization, now is the time to do so. Well, I want to just give a shout out to Canadians, if I can, about uh, voting. And, and those that got out to the polls, voting works. And, and we saw it this time around. And... Uh, and, and I want to I want to say that uh, it's freedom that we're after, and uh, I don't really have anybody that I want to you know give a shout out to, except that the fight for freedom continues. And freedom is the right to do or not do whatever you want to do or don't want to do, unless you're harming somebody else. And a crime is intentionally causing harm to somebody else. It's not having possession of some God-given natural herb that you think you, you're going to use for helping yourself. So, I guess that's what I would say in my little time allotted. And, <laughs> and Kelly. For and Kelly? Yes, thanks a lot for being on the show, Neil. It's uh, been a pleasure, as always. And uh, I hope that we will have you 
back again someday soon. Um, and for medical patients that are interested in a free vaporizer, um, just send me an email, uh, Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at kdkwholesale.ca. Hope to hear from you all soon. Take care. And I want to remind people that we are a team here on the big broadcast, and you can tune in and check out lots of great programming from Mark Emery or Skunk Magazine or Judge James Gray or myself or Andre Herman, and the list is long. We've got a newsletter on the website. You can also check out, download, and it's inexpensive to print out to share with your friends. That's head up by Al Graham, who also does Pace Radio here on the network. Lots of free editorial cartoons at Time for Hemp. You can also tune in and watch us grow marijuana on the site. Other cartoons to enjoy on timeforhemp.com. Get your apps to put into your smart di- devices so you can listen to us on the go. Find all kinds of great free programming you can download in our MP3 libraries because Time for Hemp is like a great joint. It's always best when you share it with your friends. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spend. Take another look and say some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper cars. Here are the facts. The United States has the largest population of prisoners per capita in the world. As of 2009, about 743 out of every 100,000 citizens were incarcerated. This brings the total prison population to just under 2.3 million, about 200,000 over the official current prison capacity. Government officials continually struggle to fix overcrowded prisons. In many cases, the solution has been to build newer, larger prisons. Private businesses have also stepped into the market, partnering with local and federal governments to build, manage, and maintain prisons across the United States. Roughly 20% of U.S. prisoners are currently held by private corporations. Supporters of this practice believe companies like CCA and the GEO Group have the know-how necessary to oversee prisoners at a cheaper rate. Opponents believe paying a private company to care for inmates will inevitably lead to corruption and a rising prison population, and it appears that, in some cases, the critics are correct. Here's where it gets crazy. In 2009, two Pennsylvania judges were accused of accepting up to $2.6 million to send juvenile suspects to private prisons operated by two companies, Pennsylvania Child Care and Western Pennsylvania Child Care. While this case presents a frightening example, it is hopefully an isolated event. This isn't to say that public sector prisons are necessarily better. Throughout America's history, prison systems have had numerous brushes with corruption, such as unethical uses of prison labor. Mistreatment is still common in private and public prisons today. In some cases, immigrants in facilities like the Stewart Detention Center have also reported abuse or mistreatment. But here's an interesting question. How did private prison companies move from housing inmates to detaining immigrants? Just how much influence do private prison companies wield on legislation? According to journalists such as Laura Sullivan, entirely too much. Writing for NPR, Laura Sullivan reported on the Corrections Corporation of America, the largest private prison company in the United States. Working behind the scenes, the CCA played an instrumental role in drafting Arizona's controversial Senate Bill 1070, ensuring a steady supply of detainees for Arizona's prison system and profits for the CCA. Public-private partnerships are nothing new, and in some industries these partnerships are the key to innovations and savings. And private prison isn't just a big business in the United States. They exist in other countries, including the United Kingdom and Israel. Yet, in every country, more and more people are objecting to the use of for-profit prisons, arguing that if a company is paid a set amount of money per prisoner per day, then there's no incentive to rehabilitate inmates or see them serve out their sentences and leave permanently. Are private prisons a positive step toward cutting costs, or is there another, less noble financial goal at play? 
how much influence should for-profit prison companies have over legislation? Are private companies and politicians making the best decisions for prisoners and society? Or is there something they don't want you to know?